thank you very much, uh, Yuri, for that uh, for that very interesting proposal on how to actually change uh, the the accounting rules to prioritise environmental protection. Uh, above the uh, profit for shareholders. We will now move on to the uh, last uh, presentation before the panel debate, uh, and, and that moves on to the issue of uh, the assurance of the reporting. Uh, and I'm happy to, to uh, introduce Amanda Sonnefeld from Lund. Um, thank you, Bieta, for the introduction and a lovely conference. It has been really motivating. And uh, I've uh, prepared a paper that focuses a lot on Sweden, but maybe I'll take this discussion on a more general level. Now, there's no doubt from our speakers this morning and our conference yesterday that reporting has a potential role to play in companies' journey towards being a sustainable company. Yet these reports are plagued with a gap, a credibility gap between its performance and what it actually does. And um, these reports are not meeting the needs of either financial or non-financial stakeholders. Now, this makes the idea of an audit very appealing. There is this widely accepted notion that, well, audits often take, taken for granted that audits would um, lead to more credible reports and therefore more credible information for decision making. Now research has shown that audits, or I will call it assurance on sustainability reports, um, vary widely in scope in terms of the subject matter being audited and the criteria and they're plagued with independence problems as well as management capture. Now, these then made organizations call for standards to govern these auditing services. So we're, in fact, putting a layer of regulation over a layer of regulation. So conventional wisdom, or if I look at all the uh, most of the policy documents today, there's this idealistic notion that standards that control assurance services would lead to better quality assurance services, which will lead to better quality reporting and better information for decision making. Now, Charlotte has mentioned that the importance of having a stronger assurance in reporting. Um, what I'd like to present here are some of the issues and challenges of sustainability assurance in itself, as well as some of the issues and challenges of applying today's standards. Now, there is a big problem because there is an inbuilt system of capture. At this moment of development, we can see that in most jurisdictions, sustainability reporting is still voluntary, and therefore management actually has a discretion to decide on where to report, how to report, how much to report, what to report, and for whom to report. Now, to legit legitimize the report, a lot of companies are starting to engage assurance providers to, co to commission third-party assurance. But then, again, we have to question who actually decides what to assure and on what matters to assure. Because what's happening now is that you could have a 116-page report with three indicators being assured by assurance providers. And that is reality. Now, the second problem is the subject matter. As we have heard this morning, that the qualitative, prospective, subjective way of reporting sustainability issues is a great challenge to the accounting profession or the audit profession, as well as to the consultants that are carrying out these engagements. Now, the third and important problem here is that it's a lack of criteria. The standards of reporting are currently being developed. Um, the epistemy or the knowledge in this area is weak and um, the role of assurance provider as well as sustainable assurance is, um, sustainability reporting is unclear. So that makes it very hard to develop a criteria for assurance and the criteria is key because it determines what the assurance is about against what standard. So there we have the situation where you have the broad idealistic notions of what an audit can achieve and that is not really balanced by the technical ability of what we can achieve with the knowledge we have today in today's audit. 
Now, coming to the development and the use of standards. I'd like to highlight that standard setting activities was uh, very intensive in the period of 1997 to 2005 on assurance on sustainability reports. On the inter international level, you have two main standards, and one of them is the ISAE 3000 by the IASB. Now, this is a generic um, assurance standard by the accountancy profession set by the IASB. And um, there are three things, um, or two more things that I'd like to highlight about this standard, aside from it is generic and covers all kinds of engagement that's not financial and non-historical. One is that the scope of this engagement is decided between the person or the party commissioning the assurance and the assurance provider. That allows for capture. And um, second, although it requires three parties for this assurance uh, to take place, the third party is not well defined. Now, another standard out there at uh, international level is the AA1000 um, assurance standard, and that is more stakeholder focused. And uh, for that standard, it focuses on the systems and processes that leads to the reporting, and reporting based on the principles of inclusiveness, materiality, and responsiveness. Now, I've um, gone through um, an empirical study on Swedish companies, and what I did find is that the standards are so vague um, that even if we have a Swedish standard that pulls or draws from these two international standards, the standards are so vague that it allows assurance providers to accommodate the individual engagements um, in which they undertake. And the role of assurance providers as seen by companies are, well, number one, information verifiers. They check that information is correct. Number two, as uh, consultants or maybe advisors, in which advise them on how to report better, how to file their filing better, how to improve their processes, how to manage their risk, depending on the engagement. And um, I've also spoken to the more advanced reporters, and they give these assurance providers the liaison role in being a mediator between the company the company's management, and the stakeholders. Now, instead of going through the Swedish case in which I have attended, because I, have, I don't have that much time, I will go, I'll jump straight onto the proposals. I think my first proposal is that there has to be clarity in what is the role of the assurance provider and the purpose of sustainability assurance. If this is made clear, it will clarify the criteria in which assurance providers can make use of, um, whether their role is that of professional trust, prof uh, trust, professional trusteeship, or is it should, should it be based on commercial logic? Now that is not very clear today. Second, we should um, have a very integrated approach and not only reform the rules that are governing these assurance providers, but we have to look at what is in company law and what is the role of the board of directors and management with regards to sustainability because they are the ones that employ this powerful tool of assurance and um, to achieve sustainability objectives. Now I'm very hesitant, very, very hesitant to make sustainability assurance compulsory at this stage of development. This is because, number one, we don't want reporting to be audit-led. And uh, number two, um, this is still very much in development. And um, what I have to say is reporting is not the end, which many people think reporting is the end. But we should encourage companies to channel resources on how they should uh, improve their sustainability performance, and then account for it, so the reporting and assurance will fall into place. And um, just a last note I, I'd like to mention is it's important to reform education. Now we have a pool of financial auditors who lack the knowledge, not all, but um, a lot of um, courses nowadays, uh, we do not focus too much in this area. And we need to reform education to make sustainability a greater part. And that will not only educate our management, um, it will also 
help in educating our assurance providers. Um, so to sum up, basically, um, three things. Reform has to be coherent. Reform has to ba be based on knowledge and not on pure passion. And um, most important of all, we have to consider the timing of our reform, that we have to be patient. And um, by imposing compulsory um, standards or compulsory, making it mandatory for um, assurance to be compulsory it could lead to um, undesirable consequences. So with that, I end. Thank you.